Good day, John. Thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. You know, we met a long, long time ago back at NSBI, and but I didn't really get to know you uh, very well until my organization started working with your organization back in the day, back in the 90s. And then I served with you on Dale Brethauer's board of directors at ISPI when you were president-elect, and then I served as a director when you were president long, long time ago, back there in the uh, early 2000s. I, I know you're retired now, but can for our audience, would you please introduce yourself, tell us about where you live and where you've worked, um, and perhaps some of the more interesting kinds of work you've been involved with over your career? I can do that. I, my name is John Swinney. As you mentioned, we have a little history that goes back. Um, pretty much retired right now, but I've been involved with what I come to understand as human performance technology pretty much for close to 50 years in some form or another. Uh, started my career by accident. I got out of college with a degree in uh, English education and immediately joined the Navy because that was your choice back in those days. Uh, a male graduated from college had a choice of uh, four different colors of clothes that he chose to wear. I chose the Navy. They looked at my degree and decided to make me an aircraft mechanics instructor. Uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, after that, got, I went to work for, uh, when I got out of the Navy, the next very next day, I went to work for a former Navy chief that uh, I had not known in the service, but I uh, got connected with. So I started working in, in industries like hospitality, retail, transportation, manufacturing, and I kind of wound up my career in retail again. And uh, it's, it's been a good ride. Excellent. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT? How did uh, you come across this? Uh, who was involved? How did that happen? Kind of difficult to say what the actual first exposure was. It was kind of an accidental exposure, I think. Uh, I mentioned uh, the military where they made me an instructor and a curriculum designer based on what they thought I had learned in college. Uh, ironically, I went to a military course on instructional design and uh, instructor platform skills and felt with those two workshops about five weeks, I learned more how-to than I did in you know, cramming four years of college into six. Uh, shortly after that, uh, my, actually my first day on the real job after I got out of the Navy, my boss gave me a book by Bob Mager called Preparing Instructional Objectives. That was another aha, and I remember uh, you know, telling Bob in later years, I, that book kind of irritated me because I was thinking, where the heck was this when I was in college? It made so much sense. Um, that got me off, started to, to believe that there's some rigor and a little bit of science in some of this stuff that we do. So that was that was probably the beginning. But shortly after that, <clears throat> excuse me, our boss uh, decided we were going to go to an NSBI conference in New Orleans. That was 1972, I believe. Again, the rigor with which some of these people approached what they were doing was kind of a surprise to me, and it was intriguing. I was learning a lot, they were sharing a lot, and it was kind of fascinating. Follow it up with another ISBI conference, NSBI then, in those days, uh, in San Francisco, and there was this uh, young man named Gary Rumler that was talking about the difference a tiny modification of behavior can make in affecting the outcome of, of some kind of a performance issue. And I don't think I realized at the time, I'd never heard the term performance technology, human performance technology, or anything like that. But he really got us thinking about some things beyond just training, which was my focus at the time. Uh, a few weeks after that, we brought uh, Praxis, Rumber and Gilbert's uh, uh, consulting group into my company to do a performance analysis workshop, and that really opened some eyes. I started... Uh, learning how to talk funny a little bit and learning how to look at outcomes as opposed to just process. So that's probably how it got started. Who who were some of your uh, biggest influence then besides uh, Gilbert and Rumler and the Praxis uh, organization? Obviously, Rumler was a big influence and, and stayed that way for, for most of my career. Um, also met Harless early on and got a, a, a copy of... Um, the title of the book, An Ounce of Analysis with a Pound of Objectives. Mm -hmm. I think I still have one of the last copies of that in captivity. Mm -hmm. I uh, tried to tried to find others, but there's there's no way you can find them, and Joe's not 
didn't have any that he could he could pass on. Uh, most the, the single most significant influence I would say was not necessarily uh, people per se, but the NSBI then ISBI conferences that I attended over the years. Met people like yourself, many many others that were willing to share, and and that that was just a, a there was a learning curve as a result of that all along. Uh, Met some people like, obviously, I mentioned Harless, Mager, Rumbler, yourself, uh, and then a little later, uh, Harold Stolovich, Danny Langdon, Kathleen Whiteside, many others were, were, were a, a significant influence on my career. Took a big leap after joining uh, Yellow Freight back in the early 80s. Our director, Jack Ziggin, insisted that each year we prepare a proposal for a session, a presentation at a session at, at the NSBI conference. It, his premise was, if we can do that and meet the criteria, we're doing the kind of work he wanted. The title of our job, uh, while we were the training department, the title of the function was performance engineer, which I think he stole directly from Rumbler and Gilbert. Um, the focus was on improving human performance and measuring results, and Jack taught me and the rest of us a lot during that time period. And if I think if you if you'd ask Jack who his influences were, you would uh, hear some of the same names that I'm mentioning. Another big influence, another big big uh, uh, motivational point for me was uh, in the late '80s, a group of uh, folks in the Kansas City area decided it might be time to start a local Kansas City chapter. So that got us involved with doing a lot of things. There were a lot of people in the area that that uh, were interested in the same kinds of things that I was, and that got us off and running for several years. So that was a lot of fun. Excellent. If you're retired now, but uh, if you were to give us your 30-second uh, elevator speech from back in the day when you were doing this work uh, directly, I mean, I think you apply the concepts and precepts of uh, human performance technology and everything that we do almost. But uh, um, as an example for others that they might be able to borrow from or lift directly, uh, what, what was your elevator speech as you explained to others uh, what it is you do and how you do it? Well, well, nowadays it would be retired, unemployed, or independent contractor, depending on what I feel like when I get up in the morning, which is mostly retired. In those days, I would have to say it's, we look at ways to improve human performance in ways that are sustainable and, and make it work. Uh, I tend to avoid use of phrases like human performance technology or any of the other, other uh, descriptors that we use that are kind of internal buzzwords, I guess, to the, to the people that are, that are performing it. And there's a lot of discussion about what the right terminology is. Frankly, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I, I like the way Dale used to say it, something like we improve performance in reproducible and replicable ways or something like that. Um, that would be the basic elevator speech. And if that starts another conversation, that's where it starts to get fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a favorite HPT term or phrase that uh, you'd like to define for us as perhaps maybe that you've, over the course of your career, you feel people have not been using it correctly and you'd like to uh, share your your definition for such? You know, I thought about this after we talked ri- originally, and, and I don't really have a favorite term that I, I want to poke at and say we're doing this wrong. I, I've come to hear I've come to hear our technology referred to in many different ways and none of it bothers me if it's meaningful to the person that's using it and I understand it that's that's good enough for me uh, I don't feel what we call it is uh, important as long as we realize there are uh, uh, words that I think I learned from you there are a hundred ways to do it right um, I'll give an example from uh, the company I work for in Iowa the company that you had some exposure to when we were working together a little bit mm-hmm. About halfway through that time period, we combined two departments and wound up with, uh, I think we had a five-person team, uh, two people that had very strong OD backgrounds, had been through uh, Stephen Covey's program at Brigham Young. Uh, The other three had strong human performance technology and training backgrounds. We clashed, um, easiest way to say it. We didn't speak the same language. Um, We were continually arguing about the best way to approach something. 
It wasn't to, until an ISPI conference that the whole department went to in um, Cincinnati. I think that would have been about 2000, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. We saw a presentation by uh, uh, Gary Rumler and another colleague on uh, basic the basics of, as they called it, uh, human performance improvement, I think is what they referred to at the time. Great session. It was a two-hour session, standing room only. Uh, our department head came out of that session and said, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about organizational development, or OD. And the rest of us looked at them and said, that's what we talk about when we're talking about human performance technology. I think after that, we retired to the bar and started figuring out ways that we could meld these two disciplines and, and uh, essentially threw out the language and came up with other ways to do it and became a, a performance consulting group that was pretty effective within that company. Um, had some fun, had some good results, and, and found that we were a better team when we figured out that we could do the same thing and just call it something different. Um, shortly after that, I think I, I bought... Uh, 30 or 35 copies of Robert Mager's book, Whatever Manager Should Know Training, mm -hmm. started with sliding under the door of some of the, the uh, uh, managers that we worked with as internal consultants. Uh, didn't help everyone, but those that read it started asking more intelligent questions, started realizing the training wasn't the universal solution to all problems, and were generally easy to work with and support. So mm -hmm. that was a good time. I enjoyed the heck out of that part of my career. Well, that's a good segue into uh, the last section here of our interview, which we discussed previously. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping to capture are stories. Stories of uh, people that are either no longer with us or still alive. Um, stories to make them more human. Humorous stories or serious stories. And uh, you indicated to me that you, you, you thought about this and that you're You've got some stories on, say, uh, uh, Gary Rumler and Bob Mager and some others. Uh, who do you want to talk about first? Well, probably Bob Mager, since that was the first, first, probably the first and most significant influence during my early years. I mentioned the book, Preparing Instructional Objectives, and uh, I was kind of in awe of his writing, especially after I read the uh, Mager Six Pack and Analyzing Performance Problems, which Mager and Pipe wrote that kind of popularized some of the stuff about uh, cause analysis and trying to figure out what's wrong before you, before you start trying to fix it. Well, that's a battle we fight every year with just about everything we work with, I think. Um, another story on Mager. I, I had not met the gentleman other than from afar at, at uh, NSBI conferences, but at one conference, there was some kind of a social event, and I had a chance to, to speak to him one-on-one. -on -one. And I mentioned that he was actually one of my favorite gurus. And he looked at me funny and I said, what have I done to insult the man? And he says, we don't like to be called gurus. And later, a couple of sentences later, I realized he was pulling my chain a little bit. He says, gurus are these people that sit on top of mountains and are generally inaccessible and think they know everything. Now, that's not what IS or NSPI is about. People here try to be accessible, try to help other people learn. That in itself was kind of a learning experience. And uh, I have to say he was right. Uh, I mentioned how much the conferences and other NSBI activities were a, a influence on my career and my thinking. And that kind of began uh, opening my eyes a little bit to realize that this is the source of great information and, and people aren't going to charge you to share the intelligence that they have and, and everything that they know. I, 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 I miss those conferences. I haven't been back in several years. I'm kind of a void in my life right now. Um, mm -hmm. Another story that kind of involves Bill Vetterlein and uh, Robert Mager, there, there was a, a conference session way back when, I think it was uh, probably, in the, uh, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, and there was a kind of a panel discussion called a ribald review of NSPI, I don't think it was ISPI then. It was more of a kind of a function of the technology. And, and Mager and Detterline together told this story. And I, I can't tell you who said what, but I can kind of out way uh, how it happened. There were some conference where there was a great big discussion and actually a debate on the value of education versus the value of training. And one of these gentlemen, I think it was Mager that stood up and said, I can prove to you that uh, an 
no, I, I, I need to back up a second. I missed, I missed the, the starting line. He said, one of them said, uh, the difference is if you know what you want your people to be able to do when they finish, it's called training. Otherwise, you'd call it education. And that got a lot of cat calls and harumps from some of the uh, 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 educators in the field, I'm sure. And then the other one, Deadline, I believe, stood up and said, I can prove to you that you believe that whether you think you do or not. And he says, think of it this way. Your daughter writes home, from, writes home from college and says, Dear Dad, I'm taking a course in sex education. That's okay. Now, if on the other hand, and he just paused. <laughs> and, of course, the, the group in the audience kind of went nuts when they figured out the implications of that. And that, that's, uh, that, that also was a lasting memory. It was, it was uh, not a lot of in-depth stuff, but still a lot of fun to, to see the reverence or irreverence of some of these guys have about how we approach some of our things. I recall that one too. <laughs> that was fun. That was a good story, yeah. And then, uh, gee, I, I had a colleague when I was working at Yellow Freight that used to mention your name a lot, most of it in positive ways. And I'm, I'm sure we crossed paths at, con paths at conferences, but uh, you showed up on the uh, on the uh, uh, local chapter plan as as being a presenter in the. At one of the chapter meetings, and I think that was the first time I met you face to face. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, um, I, I, I was being recruited by this company in Iowa, and I uh, was planning on an interview. I think it was just like a couple, few weeks later that I went up for their first interview. And the the uh, director of that organization, I guess he was the vice president, was somewhat impressed, I think, that, that I actually knew who you were, and I didn't tell her that I didn't know you well, that I just met you and heard of some of your works. I'd like to say that, that you know, dropping your name uh, helped me get the job, uh, but I won't. I, I'd like to, but I... <laughs> yeah. But uh, you had a saying, too, that, that uh, a couple of things that you, you uh, did for me that I thought were kind of interesting. When we were working on my first experience doing a live curricular arch architecture design workshop with you, uh, one of your preps as we were getting ready to take on these guys in our technical services group was, uh, our objective is to wear them out before they wear us out. I had no idea how true that was going to be until I saw what was going to happen then. And uh, then it, there was another thing you followed up with is, is if we do this right, at the end of the session, we're going to hear things like, I never want to do this again, but boy, did we get a lot of good stuff. Uh, that was prophetic. I kept hearing stuff like that in this company, actually, for the rest of the time I worked there, from the people that were involved. Um, we worked on the data that came out of that workshop for two or three years, building uh, structure into this organization that hadn't existed before and helping them formalize and... and, and uh, structure some of their training and development activities. That, that was a pretty powerful piece of work. And I think that was that was the one we did together. And prior to that, we did three or four that you were facilitating with our sales group and some of our manufacturing group and so forth. So another learning curve. And I'd never heard of the phrase curriculum architecture design. It was kind of like human performance technology. Like, what's that? Well, of, course all, well, of course, all the credit goes to the master performers and other subject matter experts that we facilitated. You know, I've got a bunch of uh, questions, and they've got uh, good answers. <laughs> really, that's the secret sauce: is having the right people in the room to uh, give you the data. All that was, there was. Yeah, that that was. They were handpicked for that reason, but there was a good structure to making it come out too, and, and uh, it, it was fun to watch it unfold and, and see what came out of it. And it was also fun to see their ownership, which was a, kind of another another uh, learning aha that. Uh, uh, I, I had from, from a project I was working on with Gary Rumler too, and the same thing. It says if they own the results, if they're involved in doing it, you've got a lot better chance of getting the result you want implemented, and uh, that's probably accurate. Mm -hmm. another, another saying that I attribute to you, and I've, I've paraphrased many times, you used to say there something like, there are a thousand ways to do it right and a hundred thousand ways to do it wrong. All we have to do is choose from the first list. Yeah. And uh, that... That takes me back, I, 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 I go back to my purest days when I first started this, is this is the right way to do this. <laughs> and 
you and others helped me kind of realize, no, there are many right ways to do this. And uh, it truly picked from the first list and we're, we're going to be successful or we have a good chance of success. So I, I think that's true, yeah. Stories and phrases I learned from people that influence my life, whether I want them to or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I could probably tell many stories about Gary Rummer, uh, probably a couple that I shouldn't, about uh, some of the ways he, some of the stories he told about things that happened in his and our organization. Um, another ISP con ISBI conference event, I had uh, uh, learned a little from Rummer before and had taken a new job in Florida, this retail organization, and was having a little trouble convincing my boss that his primary measurement of how many people were hired versus how many people were trained is not necessarily the best way to go about things. And we had the discussion. He was, he was interested, but wasn't quite sold. Um, I got him to attend the ISBI conference, I think it was 1977 in San Francisco, if I get the date right. I try to remember these dates because they were milestones for me. And, and my objectives was to get him to a session where he could hear Rumler speak, and maybe we could have a little conversation about that. We wound up going to a session titled something like, How to Turn Your Training Factory into a Human, in, uh, to a human Performance Organization, or something like that. It was put on by Bob Powers and Gary, uh, by, I'm sorry, Gary, Gary Rumler and Bob Powers. Gary did spoke first said, here's the model, here's the process, and then Power spoke and says, here's how we worked it into our organization and how we made it happen, and what worked, what didn't work, what I do differently, and so forth. My boss got very uncharacteristically quiet during the last half of this session, and I think I've either hit a home run or I've had a career-limiting experience, one or the other. Came out of that session, still quiet, and he turns to me and says, is there another place where we can talk to this guy, Rumler. I'd like to learn a little bit more from him. And the Cracker Barrel sessions that we used to have then were just coming up where uh, uh, someone like a Rumler and, and Miggers and all the other people will have a three sessions that they'll rotate and people move from table to table. It didn't quite work that way. My boss and I sat at his table for the first Cracker Barrel session and literally monopolized the conversation for all three of his Cracker Barrel sessions. And I'm sure it irritated the heck out of Gary until we uh, hired him a couple months later to come in and, and do some work with us at the, uh, the company I was working for then. Um, my boss became a believer, and he helped us turn loose uh, Gary and a, a task force that Gary helped us select. Uh, and I remember his criteria was, we're going to use six people from various divisions, and what we sell it to the division managers is we want the people that you can least afford to... Uh, uh, get rid of because they're the ones that are going to dig the deeper, the deep, deepest, and have the ownership. And oh, also they've got to not be afraid to say BS to the witch doctor, which was a phrase that I think Gary picked up from my boss. That was his favorite one. So we wanted people that were not afraid to uh, speak to authority. Um, got a great team, had some fascinating uh, project work that was done. We had some little interesting hiccups along the way. Uh, team came in, uh, all, all the two of us were from out of town. The team and Gary came in one time, all staying at the same hotel. We worked late to the night, one night, getting some stuff done. I, I remember Sangria was involved in that session, which probably had nothing to do with the outcome. But um, the next day we found that, that um, as we went out and did some of our work in the office and, and looked at some of the stuff that we were dealing with, some of the data, uh, all of the rooms, some of the rooms got broken into in that hotel, and they came in through the patios and the open patios and doors, so probably an inside job. Every room except Gary's got broken into. Uh, we wondered about that for a while, and I never did get a full, ex <coughs> excuse me, a full explanation of why that one room was, was uh, bypassed, but must have been something important, and, and I, I don't know if there was anything else going on or not, but it was a, it was a fun thing to gig people about. Mm -hmm. Uh, the end result, though, that was a company-wide uh, kind of a career-defining project for me. Uh, it started out as an analysis of performance improvement opportunities for three key positions in this retail chain, about a 1,500 store retail chain. Uh, training was the presenting problem. We were supposed to look at ways to train them to be more effective in their job. And, and following the models that Rumler and Gilbert put together, we quickly came to realize there is not a lot of opportunity improve, for improvement between them. What we were looking at was uh, 
financial performance of stores that were about average as compared to stores that were in the top 10 percentile to see if we could define the differences. Mm -hmm. What we found were a lot of surprises. The areas that we thought were probably the least effective and the least profitable were actually the difference between stores that were good versus stores that were just okay. And one of the other surprises was in one department in particular that we thought was the most profitable, profitable we were getting ripped off big time. Uh, we, uh, we found training is not the big answer here, but we've got a $27 million a year shrinkage problem that we were not aware of. Mm -hmm. the, the controller was saying this all along. The controller of the company was one of the allies that we picked up as we went along. Gary's model was make sure the people that you're doing this for are familiar with what you're finding, whether they like it or not. Let's not do surprises. Um, after saying, let's not do surprises, he gave me a big surprise one day. Uh, my assignment during this project, other than managing the project, was working with another guy that was one of our division controllers to, to try to define this economic model and what was going on, what wasn't going on. Very complex, a lot of work, a lot of labor went into it, and a lot of detail was, was, was involved with it. But the results spoke for themselves. You couldn't look at it and say, this is what's wrong. No, it's not. It's in this area right here, and we need to do something about it. We brought all the division managers into the, to the company in Clearwater, Florida, for the, the final meeting, which was about a two-hour session where Gary was going to walk us through findings and recommendations. We're sitting out in the front room just before the meeting gets started, and Gary turns to me and says, uh, Swinney, you know the financial model probably better than I do. Why don't you do that part of the presentation? Didn't have time to get nervous. Uh, went in and just walked through it like I'd done for our boss and some of the people who were keeping up, up to speed and, and literally hit a home run with it. And the controller was sitting in the back with a grin on his face. I knew if I had a problem, I had, I had backup right there, so I wasn't too worried about it. Had he told me that the night before, I'd have been up all night. Mm -hmm. well, any sleep. He pulled it off just at the last minute and it, it went off pretty good. So I came out of that looking pretty good. The team came out of it looking pretty good. Our VP and the president that sponsored the thing decided they were going to go to supper with us rather than division managers because we were more fun and knew more of what was going on. Fun project. Um, that My connection with Gary pretty much continued through the remainder of my career kind of an unofficial mentor. Um, was able to bring him into some additional companies to help train some of our people. Uh, he was very instrumental at Yellow Freight in helping us turn a very good group of field trainers into field performance improvement specialists. And they relished that job because they were really getting involved in it. So, gosh, I've just rambled on and on and given kind of a nutshell of some of the fun stuff I've done, or at least it was fun to me. Uh, it may be boring to everyone else, but... Um, no, this is great. Thanks. Thanks. I had some good, good, good fun and good contacts. It was a good career. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for those stories. Um, let me wrap up here by asking if there are any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you would give our audience, especially targeting people that are, are entering the field and are new to that. What, what would your words of advice be to them? I'd probably say proceed slowly, but proceed. You're going to fight some battles you'll lose, but don't be afraid to come back. Um, gosh, I even had a similar story to that in my, my company that I just retired from a couple of years ago. Uh, and that company training was the universal solution, and a lot of it was mandated. We worked in the compliance group. But a uh, project was presented to me on training some people in California to help us get out of a consent decree that was costing us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know the exact data. They told me several million per year. Uh, people were not doing what they were supposed to do to help get out of this career. And if we were going to have an, uh, get out of this uh, um, consent decree, sorry. Uh, and the, the, the company at the time was convinced we need to do better training. Took a look at the training seemed quite adequate and it was pretty straightforward. The task wasn't wasn't difficult. There were two or three kinds of stimuli that needed to respond to and the response was the same each time. You just do it automatically, but it wasn't happening. So I was able to sell uh, our senior director the idea that there's more influences than just training and lack of skill and knowledge is what's going on here. We probably ought to take a look and do a little cause analysis. Uh, he agreed. I think the model I used was um, from an ISPI journal, um, 
David Weil was his name or Wiley. It was, it was a, mm-hmm. he, he kind of took several models and summarized them in a, in a very clean hierarchy of here are the seven or eight things that affect human performance, one of which was skill and knowledge. But the uh, senior director got kind of intrigued by that. So he and a colleague, a colleague and I went out and spent a week in California, interviewed 60 people uh, or so and 15 stores and found one out of that group that really didn't know quite what to do. The rest of them knew exactly what to do but had a whole host of reasons for why they weren't doing it. There was one tiny little piece of information they were missing. Uh, the, the, the main reason they were doing is if they felt appropriately that customers were trying to take advantage of the system and ripping us off. Uh, and I won't go into detail about what that was. It, it, that's irrelevant. But they were correct in that assumption. What they didn't know is that if we bite the bullet and follow the procedure, and we are seen as following the procedure the next time they do an inspection, we get out of the consent decree and don't have to do it anymore. So instead of training in regular staff meetings that they held at the store, the manager gave a clear message. You might not have known this, but if we continue this, we've got about another six or eight weeks, and if we're inspected and are doing right, you won't have to do it anymore. Got out of the consent decree, saved millions of dollars. Um, I got a lot of satisfaction and a $50 bonus which was real nice. I, I, I told him I'd sell it for a percentage. But, uh, I'm, I'm rambling on what you're asking for advice, but I, I guess I'd say never give up. Gary used to say, fight the good fight. And that's what he's talking about, I think. Yes, well, those are, those are good, uh, good words of wisdom is to fight on and uh, keep on digging for the root cause rather than uh, just addressing some of the symptoms. John, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video, and uh, thank you for your friendship uh, over the years and uh, for all that you've taught me. Um, uh, I, I wish you a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.